nagy szeretettel az Unisys színeváltozás című kiállítás megnyitóján az Ír Nagykövetség nevében Szegedi Jó Marianna vagyok. Ez az esemény egy kétnyelvű esemény lesz, angolul és magyarul is elhangzanak beszédek, és a kiállítás megnyitót a fuga rögzíti. Ezért arra kérjük Önöket, hogy legyenek szívesen kapcsolják ki a telefonok telefonjukat, a mobil telefonjukat. So we would like to ask everybody to switch to cell phones off because Fuga, who is hosting this exhibition, uh, they will record, you know, the opening of the exhibition so, and the concert. So uh, please switch to cell phones off. Először a Fuga nevében Rajk Judit fogja köszönteni a jelenlévőket, majd pedig Írország nagykövetségének nevében a nagykövető Roland Garden mond rövid köszöntőt. Ezt követően az Ír Kortás Zenei Központ képviseletében Lindaus, Lindausi Fáren fog pár mondatot mondani, majd pedig a Magyarországi James Doyle Társaság vezetője Takács Ferenc fog pár szót szólni. Ezt követően egy ö, ö, rövid zenei betét hangzik el, méghozzá ö, Katarzina Broksoka, rosszul mondtam, ö, ö, Katarzina Broskova három dala hangzik el, James Joyce Chamber Music ö, 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 művére komponált három darab, amelyet a liszt Zene Akadémia professzorai adnak elő, Rajk Júlia, Fejérvári Zsolt és Bál Dávid. A zenei betétet követően pedig az Ulisszes színeváltozásai című kiállítás kuratora Gettó Katalin a Janusz Panonius Múzeumtól fog pár szót szólni a kiállításról, a kiállításról, amelyen Szemeti Imre és Martin Ferenc képei láthatóak. Gettó Katalin Beszédét követően pedig egy pódiumbeszélgetés hangzik el Joyce és a zene kapcsolatáról, amely pódiumbeszélgetésen Linda Osha Farren és Jonathan Grimes, a Dublini Cortez Zenei Központ vezetői fognak beszélni Benjamin Dwyer zeneszerzővel. Ezt követően tudják megtekinteni azt a filmet, azt a hat rövid filmet, amely hat rövid film Joyce Ulysses című inspirációjára készült, és amely filmnek a bemutatója Ulysses utazása 2022 Budapesten és Magyarországon először itt tekinthető meg. Köszönjük szépen a figyelmüket, és akkor átadnám a szót rajt Juliának, Juditnak, a, aki a fóga nevében köszönti önöket. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, dear ambassador, warm welcome here in Fuga, uh, a venue which is a meeting point of different cultures. Tonight, this event, what we started to organize more than a year ago with the Contemporary uh, uh, Music Center from Dublin and also with the Embassy. Uh, it's a big pleasure to, to have pictures and paintings, drawings on the board, uh, illustrating Lisa's journey and also having music, live music here and then uh, screening in the other hall. So enjoy the event and uh, warm welcome again. And the floor is yours, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Julia, and welcome to everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Joyce and Zakarja. It's a fantastic and I'm to be, have all of you here tonight. I'm delighted to be here to open this exhibition. As Julia said, it's been a, a labour of love uh, with a number of partners and collaborations over the last 12 months. And of course, we're here tonight for because of one man and one book, and that man is James Joyce, and that book is Ulysses. Um, and this year is a very special year because we celebrate centenary of the publication of Ulysses. So it really amazes me that 100 years later, 100 years after that book was published in 1922, that we're still here celebrating Ulysses, but not only celebrating Ulysses, but also still being inspired by Ulysses and by the work of James Joyce. 
through tonight, through visual art, through uh, contemporary art, through modern art, through film, through music. Uh, and we're all looking forward to having a fantastic musical performance as well. Um, I really want to, first of all, to thank everyone that's been involved in this uh, exhibition. Um, this is sort of the, the final public event that we're having as part of the Embassy of Ireland <coughs> uh, program of events for UDC's 100. Um, on Wednesday we had a fantastic contemporary music concert in the, in the Budapest Music Centre, which we worked with the Contemporary Music Centre Dublin uh, on. Uh, and yesterday I was, had the pleasure of being in Sambatai for the Bloom State Festival, where we had a fantastic unveiling of a, a mural art project by Irish artist Aideen Barry. Um, and then tonight we have the exhibition here, here, here in Fuga. So it's been a really busy three days, but extremely enjoyable uh, three days. And this all happened because of, of partnerships and collaborations all brought together through the joy of Joyce. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to uh, Fuga for, for letting us to hall, um, and a fantastic venue it is, and a fantastic space for the type of exhibition that we have. I'd like to thank the uh, Hungarian James Joyce Society and uh, Takas Ferenc is here tonight, the President, and we'll speak a bit later. Um, we put in place uh, a number of events throughout this year in collaboration with the Hungarian James Joyce Society. So without their help, the celebrations this year would not have been possible. I'd like to thank the uh, Contemporary Music Centre in Dublin. Linda is here and, and Ben and, and a few other people and uh, um, uh, Graham, or sorry, what's... Jonathan. Jonathan, sorry, was it Jonathan Grimes? And Graham, Graham. Jonathan Grimes is here, um, and we've been working with the CMC for a number of years now, uh, and they've been a fantastic partner for us through uh, the UDC's program, but also in other programs such as our St. Bridges Day celebrations. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'd also like to thank the Janusz Pannonius uh, uh, Gallery and Page, um, without which we would not be able to bring a lot of these fantastic paintings, particularly by uh, Ferenc Martin. And Ferenc Martin is an artist that's become very close to my own heart uh, because it was when I arrived here in Hungary I, I, un I started to understand his close connections with Ireland, that he had a, an Irish lineage, but then also that he was very much inspired by James Joyce and Ulysses. And it's great to have here tonight some of his family, his great uh, grandnieces here tonight with her husband, so thank you so much, King, for being here to celebrate with us. Um, so we can see some of his art and then also some of the art of a, a contemporary artist, Imri, is on, on this side of the wall, which is an amazing, again, uh, depiction and representation of Ulysses. Um, so again, just to say thank you to everyone for being here tonight, for joining us in our celebration of James Joyce and Ulysses, uh, and I, I hope that you have a very really enjoyable night. Please, after the end of the sort of presentations and, and the speeches, please grab a glass of wine, look around the exhibition, and then also go and watch the uh, six short films with the accompanying music in, in, the, music, in the other room next door at, at, at about eight, ten past eight. So please enjoy your, enjoy your evening, uh, and now I'll hand the floor over to Linda to talk about the uh, CMC project journey, UBC's Journey 2022. Ambassador Gargan and Deeve Galair Greenushla, who's fought to the Fuga Budapest Architecture Centre. Yo Eshte Ki Vanok. I'm Linda O'Shea Farn, Projects, Programmes and Events Manager at the Contemporary Music Centre Ireland, and I am joined by two of my colleagues, Jonathan Grimes and Maeve Noonan. On behalf of all of us at CMC, the staff, the board, and the director, Yvonne Ferguson, who sends her best wishes for this evening's event. I wish to thank you, the audience, for joining us in Fuga this evening, our second event here in Budapest on this stage of the Ulysses Journey project. Like all major projects, Ulysses Journey 2022 has involved enormous planning, collaboration and funding, and a number of key partners both in Ireland and abroad. Tonight we are delighted to partner with His Excellency Ambassador Ronan Gargan and his team at the Embassy of Ireland Hungary and also with Fuga Budapest Architecture Centre where we have had the great pleasure of working with Julia Yuri, Professor Judith Reke and Christoph Asbot and we are delighted also to share the stage tonight with Joyce in Transfigurations, Ulysses and Ireland in the works of Ferenc Martin and Imre Semete. Uh, also with the wonderful musicians of the List Academy and with the Charlie Design where our films are going to be uh, screened. Thank you also to Abba Petnecki and Andras Kegel of the Budapest Music Centre for their very kind assistance to Christoph and the team here with their sound equipment for tonight's film screenings. Ulysses Journey 2022 is a feast of contemporary music, film and discussion 
that has been running since the 2nd of February this year across Dublin, Belfast, Budapest and Paris, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the publication of Ulysses by James Joyce on the 2nd of February 1922 in Paris. From its early concept as a Bloomsday in Budapest concert by Hungarian guitarist Kathleen Kaltai and Irish soprano Elizabeth Hilliard, scheduled for Bloomsday in June 2020, which is now two years ago, this project has grown into Ulysses' Journey 2022, with the addition of six new music commissions and the commissioning of six films from Ireland that will be screened here tonight, and the discussion on Joyce and music, which we'll also hear tonight by compo composer Ben Dwyer in, in conversation with me. A special welcome to Ansel MacDonald, composer of the new work for the film Pollen, Blood and Sea Spray, for accordion performed by Dermot Dunn, electronics by Ansel and himself, and spoken word by Nicole Ruhr, who we are also delighted to see here tonight. A warm welcome also to all composers featured in Wednesday night's concert, Dara Black Hines, Greg Caffrey, Benjamin Dwyer, Shamu Grillis, Petra Chassis, and we were also joined by Hungarian composer Mate Valop, and I'm delighted to say he's winging his way to Paris at the moment, so he can join us there tomorrow night. As I mentioned, this evening's event formed parts of a series of events, performances, discussions, new music and commissions and film screenings, uh, involving support from a number of partners. We're very grateful to the Embassy here. We also extend our sincere thanks to Centre Culturel Your Long Day in Paris and director Nora Hickey, to the Budapest Music Centre Centre Culturel Angois in Paris, Embassy of Ireland Hungary, Embassy of Hungary Dublin, Fruga Budapest, Sonic Arts Research Centre in Belfast, Irish Film Institute, New Music Dublin, One Dublin, One Book, Moving On with Music Belfast, and Sundays at Noon Concert Series in Dublin. They are all our partners. It has been a very long journey and a very fulfilling one. I would now like to welcome Professor Ferenc Tukac of the James Joyce Society here in Hungary to say his words of welcome. Köszönöm. <laughs> Jó estét kívánok! Uh, ugye hát abban kezdeném, amivel mindenki kezdi, száz éves az Ulisszesz. De most ez a száz év nem csak az könyv klasszicizálódásáról szólt, hanem arra a folyamatról, amelynek során az Ulisszesz Joyce műve és Joyce élete és maga Joyce alapja, Mítizálódott. Mítosz lett belőle, amit a társművészetek, az irodalom is és a, és a társművészetek is ö, újra és újra felhasználnak, pontosan úgy, ahogy ö, például a Don Giovanni alakját és történetét a Tirso de Molinától kezdve ö, John Bergerig, kiaknázza az irodalom, a zene, az az újabb és újabb variációk születnek Joyce életére és Joyce művére. Magyarországon is emlékezünk Békés Pálnak a Jelvlecke című híres elbeszéléséről, Eszterházi Péter számtalan Joyce utalására, Cserna Szabó Andrásnak a Blumféle veséről szóló, hát groteszk írásáról, írására, vagy Parti Nagy Lajosnak a Dublini eh, jegyzetfüzet című versfüzérére, ami szintén egy ilyen Ulysses variáció. Ugye mindenféle máshol is megtörtént, ugyanez eh, Joyce maga eh, fellép például a Fred O'Brien-nek a a Dalki Archívum című regényében ő ott egy Dublini külvárosi kocsmában csapos, aki hát panaszkodik, hogy az ő identitását valaki ellopta, és az ő nevén kiadta ezt a szörnyűséget, az Ulisszeszt, és hát ő ettől undorodik és sétve érzi magát. Itt van egy egész különös darab, Nóra Juga, egy nagyon idős 
román írónő, akinek a Szapunului Leopold Bloom című könyve, azaz Leopold Bloom Szappanja című könyve, szintén egy ilyen Joyce variáció, vagy a nemrég megjelent, magyar is pár évben megjelent spanyol írónak, az Enrique Villanatasznak a Dublinesk című könyve, amelyben tulajdonképpen a, a regénynek a hádész fejezetét, ugye a pedig dignam temetését hát dolgozza fel újra. Egy Tom Gallagher nevű skót drámaírónak még a 70-es évek elején volt egy nagyon híres és sikeres darabja, a Mr. Joyce elhagyja Párizt, és ő, megemlíteném a legszellemesebbet is, a francia Raymond Könónak a, a On est toujours trop bon avec les femmes című regényét, ennek az a címe magyarul, mert megjelent magyarul, és mindig nagyon kényeztetjük a nőket. Ebben az 1916-os Dublini Husvéti felkelés egy osztaga, ugye behatol a főposta épületébe, és elfoglalja azt, és a, az osztagnak a szereplői az Ulisszesből kigyűjtött neveket viselik, tehát egyről egyik a nevük szerepel a, 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 az Ulisszesben. Valami hasonló zajlott le a populáris művészetekben és filmekben, ugye, a, hát a leghíresebb ennek az ikonikus összefoglalója az a híres fénykép, amikor egy forgatás szünetében Marilyn Monroe az ulysses olvasgatja, és nagyon úgy néz ki, hogy inkább a vége felét olvasgatja, talán érthető okokból. A Robert De Niro egyik kémfilmjében az ügynökség címmel játszották Magyarországon, az Ulysses egy példánya rejti a, 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 a kémkódot, a Baz Lermannek a Great Gatsby-ében az irodalomban foglalkozó főhős, azt talán ott van a Ulyssesnek az ős kiadása, és így tovább, és így tovább. Egy Amerikai professzor asszony, bizonyos Amanda Cross írt egy nagyon érdekes krimit még a 60-as években, a The James Joyce Murder, tehát a James Joyce gyilkossága a címe. Tehát ahová nyúlunk, látjuk, hogy a, a kortársi, a modern irodalmi tudat állandóan beleütközik Joyce-ba, és állandóan, hát merik Joyce-ból, és állandóan kifigurázza, tovább írja, kiterjeszti, stb. Ugyanezt történt a más művészetekben is, ugye a zenében se szerék, se száma a James Joyce által ihletett, vagy a James Joyce reflektáló művekre. Itt talán egyetlen egy magyar szerzőre hívnám fel a figyelmet, Seiber Mátyásra, aki 1905 és 1960 között élt, ő, ő 1947-ben írta meg a, az Ulysses Kantát a című bővét, és ö, emellett ne, még más Joyce szövegeket is megzenésített. Vagy a másik vége a dolognak, Anthony Burgess, a gépnarancs írója, az 1000 1982-es centenáriumra írt egy operettet, Blues of Dublin, tehát Dublin blumjai címmel. És természetesen ugyanez a képzőművészetekben is lezajlott. Itt tulajdonképpen első szabadna kezdeni a, a, a Joyce ihlette, ihlette és az Ulysses ihlette, képzőművészeti alkotásoknak a, a sorát. Egyetlen egyet talán megemlítenék, Richard Hamilton, a, a popártnak a, a nagy angol hát festő alakja, grafikai alakja, 
1948 és 1998 között 50 éven át illusztrálta az ulisses és rajzok tömegét hozta létre, ezek közül sokat utána meg is festett. Tehát tulajdonképpen életművének a, egy jelentős része abból áll, hogy, hogy festmélek foglalkozik az ulisses -szel. Ehhez csatlakozik a mi kiállításunk, ezúttal egy hát klasszikus magyar bővész Martin Ferenc, aki egyébként ír származású a Galvai megyei híres Martin családnak egy leszármazotta és mellette pedig egy kortárs művész Szemeti Imre, aki művei, aki hosszú évtizedek óta ö, sorozatokat gyárt, tehát sorozatok egész sorát ö, ö, alkotja meg, ö, Dublinról, az Ulisseszről, ö, ilyen szürreális, fantasztikus, irónikus és és hát végtelen érdekes módon a legkülönbözőbb grafikai műfajokban. De erről majd a kiállítás kurátora fog egy későbbi időpontban részletesebben beszélni. Köszönöm szépen ezt szeretném. Let me perform with my colleagues three songs based, based on Jim, uh, James Joyce's poems from his very early period from the so-called chamber music cycles. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to work with contemporary composers. But uh, today it's a big pleasure that the composer of these songs, Katarzyna Brochocka from Poland, from Warsaw, is here with us, Sir Katarzyna.
An exhibition on paintings of Martin Ferenc, Ferenc Martin, and Imre Semeti. Katrin, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ambassador, dear guests. This event tonight, combining literature and visual art, music and film, demonstrates the huge impact and inspiration of Joyce's Ulysses on all, all art forms in the past and today. Reviewing the international programs of the Ulysses Centenary, we find that, quite naturally, compared to the literary drama, film and music performances, visual art is a little less prevalent in the program. So I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to be part of this great, great project, which is focusing on visual adaptations of Ulysses and beyond that, on the inspiration of the Irish culture in the modern Hungarian art. Adaptation, paraphrase, or illustration? This question emerged several times throughout the history of Ulysses inspired art. I have no time to relate the whole story, I just want to mention the two extremities. The earliest infamous case of Henri Matisse in 1935 who totally ignored Joyce's novel and created Homer fantasies instead. And the latest, latest Ulysses edition, published this year, with a faithful scene-by-scene -scene illustrations of the Spanish artist Fernando Arroyo, with the intention of presenting Joyce's epic novel in a new, more accessible light, as advertised. Between Matisse and Arroyo, more than 20 relevant Ulysses visual adaptations have been created in the last hundred years, showing an amazing variety of the possible artistic approaches. When determining the position of the two Hungarian artists, Ferenc Martin and Imre Semeti in this regard, it should be pointed out that both of them are among the few who have had a deep and long-lasting connection to Ulysses, the novel and the character, and beyond that, to Ireland and the Irish culture. The artworks displayed at this exhibition are not of an occasional nature. They were not responding to requests for establishments. <coughs> True, Martin completed his Ulysses project in 1982 for the centenary of Joyce's birth, but this was only a final act of a process lasting several decades. Both series transcend the boundaries of the genre of mimetic illustration. Both represent significant agendas in the artist's purpose, 
becoming part of the, uh, their artistic mythology. In the case of Martin, Ireland became part of his individual mythology as well, since his emotional attachment to Ireland was a cornerstone of his identity as a person as an, and as an artist. Uh, it is widely known that Ferenc Martin, one of the most prominent figures of the modern art movement in Hungary, had Irish ancestry. His great-grandfather and brothers had settled in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the beginning of the 19th century, where they were employed as soldiers. Uh, knowledge of not being anchored uh, entirely in Hungarian soil, that, uh, that his family history is partly rooted in, the, in a distant land, gave Martin a sort of cosmopolitan spirit, facilitating to him to be home practically anywhere in Europe. After living for almost um, 15 years in Paris, in the very center of the European abstract art movement, um, in 1940 he returned to Hungary, first to Budapest and a few years later to Pécs. Uh, one might think that he struggled with, this recon with reconnecting with uh, uh, his homeland, but this was not the case. I do not feel myself being anchored to a particular location. It is all the same to me where I work, in Pécs, in Paris, or in Budapest, he wrote in a letter. Despite the fact that Martin referred many times to his Irish ancestral home, and uh, from the 1940s, Irish themes and motifs returned over and over in his works. His relationship to Ireland remained mostly platonic all in his life, except one late visit to Dublin in 1971. Still, for more than 30 years, he taught and wrote about Ireland as if he had been reminiscing, and he frequently entitled uh, his works as Memories, Memory of Ireland, mem Memory of Ireland with a Heart, and so forth. In this vocabulary, memory expresses rather nostalgic emotions than actual recollections, as if Ireland served as self-affirmation, reminding him of his borderless identity. As such, Ireland becomes a metaphor of his self-extension. The sea, the coast, the shore cliffs, seashells, ships and harbors are all requisites of this Ulyssesian existence of being on a never-ending imaginary journey all the time and being at home anywhere. The fame of Joyce's Ulysses reached Hungary in the mid-1920s. Uh, the great Hungarian poet and literator, Mihai Bogic, was the one who first mentioned Joyce's novel for his guests. The members of his art company got together in his Budapest apartment. It should be translated to Hungarian, Bogic suggested. The 55-year-old Martin was presented this evening. He was bound to leave to Paris that time. He heard Joyce's name first there, from Bovic. During his stay in Par Paris, Martin witnessed the countless scandals over the newest editions of Ulysses, the banning, the confiscation of the volumes. When returning to Hungary in 1940, he brought the French version of Ulysses with him. Fifteen years passed when he created his Ulysses oil painting, a vague, unsettling figure standing in a harbor-like setting facing to the sea. This is the first manifestation of Martin's self-projection onto the character of Ulysses, the Homeric and Joycean character that will be prevalent in his late works. Uh, 1966 is the year when he returns to the topic. He didn't have any special reason to do that, no anniversaries or assignments. His new interest revived after creating his amazing graphic series in the 1950s, inspired by the works of Cervantes, Malarmé, Flaubert, and others. These drawings are not illustrations either. Tibor Tüskés, the literary historian, calls Martin's work literary drawings in his essay. Martin's bloom Ulysses, Tüskés claims, is a mythical figure who lives in a profane reality. He is a king in disguise, magnificent and humble. The two artists, Martin and Imre Semetis, Ulysses uh, series are parallel in many aspects. Firstly, as I said, Ulysses is not a one-night stand for them, but a lifelong fascination. The two have similar concepts in relating to the literary text. Instead of following a traditional illustrative and mimetic agenda, they develop the idiosyncratic version built on a genuine literary experience. 
Szemet Imre studied at the Hungarian University of Fine Arts in the second half of the 1960s. Literary courses were available for the art students as well, uh, and the, this fact probably helped him to form his wide perspective as an artist. He read the novel in 1969 and was impressed by it for a lifetime. From then on, he has been working on his Ulysses project almost continuously. As a graduate student, he visited Dublin for a three-week study tour. Based on that experience and his readings, he created the first Ulysses series in 1970 as his master project. This collection displayed here, selected from his five consecutive Ulysses theme periods, represents a breathtaking transfiguration of the inspiring experience of Ulysses of Dublin, of Ireland, and the artist's ever-changing attitude, from the intricate magical realism of the early work to the radical fragmentation of the latest cycle. The Dublin series from, from 1997 is characterized by the deconstruction of the former structure of the image, fragmentation, ambiguous allusions to the literary content. The dreamlike bird figure, city and landscape reminiscences, the soft pictorial texture evoke the lyrical abstract style of Ferenc Martin, whom Semeti considers his role model and listed master. The blue interior acrylic painting uh, also the cycle also demonstrates Semeti's special attitude of inscribing a visual idea onto a narrative. The interior space is shown in a distorted perspective, which also appeared in his other not Ulysses related works at that time, called to mind empty stages with the scenery of Ulysses, where the characters of, uh, uh, are reduced to dark, sketchy, uncanny figures, if not absent entirely. Having regard uh, to all the Ulysses cycle of Yosemite, there are good grounds for saying that it is related to Joyce's work at a deep structural level. By its centerless extensity, endless continuity, its splintered fragmentation, by the mechanism of free association. By its organized irregularity, borrowing the term of, uh, from the Hungarian writer and philosopher Béla Hongos from his Joyce essay. Perhaps it is uh, fair to say that Semeti's work can be interpreted as a visual manifestation of the Joycean stream of consciousness. Within that, Omnium Gatherum series uh, can convey the realm of unconscious mind by its obscure, tense, twisted vision. Among <coughs> of the various quality of, uh, qualities of Joyce's Ulysses, grotesque prevails here. The allusions to the text become more ambiguous than ever. After reaching this end point, the ongoing Ulysses live weight cycle seems to reconnect to the earlier stages of this journey. Of this journey. The reminiscences of Dublin, the shore, the images of cliffs and castles reappear, human figures unfold from the background. The sparse monochrome pencil lines will be enriched with two-tone bolt and blotches, evoking the soft textured look of the original Dublin series from 1997. The title, Live Weight, suggests the expansion of his enormous project, comprising today more than 2,000 items, items altogether. And the journey around Ulysses is still not over, or maybe it is not even a journey anymore. To him, Ulysses has become a place to reside in. Dear guests, enjoy this exceptional show. Thank you for your before the discussion on music and uh, Ulysses, and Linda O'Shee Farren and Benjamin O'Dwyer. The floor is yours. Thank 
Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Grimes, Content Manager with the Contemporary Music Centre. And on behalf of the Board of the Contemporary Music Centre and the Director, Yvonne Ferguson, who sends her very best wishes for this evening's concert, I'm delighted to introduce the next part of tonight's programme, which is a discussion on Joyce and music. You'll hear from my colleague Linda O'Shea Farron shortly in conversation with Benjamin Guar, composer, performer and writer on some of the ways Joyce has influenced music and music has influenced Joyce. Benjamin Dwyer is a composer of numerous works ranging from orchestral to chamber to solo instrumental. His recent work, Sacrum Profanum, a major work, was released on Farcone Records. And for those of you who are at the concert at the Budapest Music Academy, uh, or Music Centre, I should say, on Wednesday, we had the real privilege of hearing the world premiere of his work for guitar, Homage à Ligeti performed by guitarist Kathleen Kuntai. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Linda O'Shea Farron, who will lead this discussion with Benjamin Dwyer on Joyce and Music. Linda. So we only have to go to page one of a portrait of the artist as a young man to hear the baby, Stephen Dedalus, who we take to be Joyce as a baby, trying to learn a song that is being taught to him, mouthing the words incorrectly. So from page one we realise that music is absolutely central to Joyce's world. Absolutely, and this is what we're going to try to explore a little bit and uh, bear with us. In other words, the influence of music on Joyce's writing. And I think you will find that it's been pretty significant. So, uh, Ben, sticking with the music, um, the ambassador's wife, Michelle, is a very fine pianist, and she will remember Fesh Keol in Ireland. So Fesh Keol yes. is a music festival, one of the longest running music festivals in the world, and it's... Uh, you know, it cites fear in every child in Ireland learning music. The people call it Feshkyo Land, that part of Dublin. Um, but Joyce very nearly won a Feshkyo Men first prize, which would have given him a scholarship yes. to learn music. So, Well, Feshkyo is the most important, I think it yes, still, is, still is, the most important Irish music competition uh, for classical music, although it has recently expanded to include composition, I'm delighted to say. Um, in 1903, the brilliant, well, he would 
go on to be the brilliant Irish tenor Patrick. John, John McCormick. Patrick Cavanagh. John McCormick uh, won the Fesh Joe. And by winning the Fesh Joe, he was given uh, a stipend to go and study in Italy, which then went on to be the foundation of his uh, illustrious career. Um, to become one of the greatest tenors of his period. Now, Joyce, the young Joyce, knew the young John McCormick, and it was McCormick who encouraged Joyce to enter into the competition the following year, 1904. Now, the strange thing about the competition at that stage was that um, whoever entered into the competition had to sight sing, which means sing from the score or read from the score without any prior notice. And while Joyce was a very good pianist and a very good singer, he wasn't exactly a trained musician in that sense. He was more of what we call an autodidact, self-taught. So he, when he was required to sight sing, he stormed out of the room and obviously didn't get the, the gold medal. He was in the end awarded the bronze medal. I actually think Ben is a slight variation even on that theme in that it was the if there was uh, not a clear winner and there were two people, one of whom could come first, they divided, you know, they chose on sight singing. So he could have come first, but then he was asked to sight sing and he stormed out of the room as you yes. say, and the other person came first, but he got a medal. It wasn't a first prize, but the Fesh Kjold has been dining out on his medal anyway, all these yes. decades. Even, even, though even though it was a bronze. Even though it was a bronze. And it does beg the question, because he, because he was such a fine, natural musician, that um, he could very well have gone on to be um, um, a singer, at least a leader. And it's interesting to note that um, his wife, Nora, yes. always used to say, you know, he should have stuck with the music and forget that writing business. Yeah, yeah. he shouldn't have bothered with that old writing. And so, but there we are, that, that remains a big question over uh, the very early stages of Joyce's career. It sure Joyce. does. Yeah. And now we'll move on to Joyce's writing, which he's altogether more famous for, I have to say. And um, can you give us a thumbnail sketch, Ben, of, you know, the ways in which Joyce used music in his writing? Well, I like to think that Joyce wrote one large book in five chapters. And he, he, he published five uh, completed uh, books, starting with chamber music, which we know the, the, the poetry, the early poetry collection, followed by a portrait of the artist as a young man. Am I missing something? Dubliners comes before that, uh, the collection of short stories, then a portrait, then Ulysses, of course, and followed by the, um, the wonderful Finnegan's Wake. Now, as we glance our eyes across this uh, lifespan of literature, we see uh, from the very beginning, obviously, it's very clear that music is very important to Joyce. Um, the title is a little bit of a giveaway, chamber music. But, um, you know, as we, as we proceed throughout that body of work, music increasingly and exponentially becomes more significant and embedded in Joyce's writing. It's, it's interesting to note that the um, references to music, there are four times more references to music in The Wake than there are in all the four publications together. So we see this increasing interest, well, interest is not the right word, this increasing absorption in music. And as music is increasingly absorbed into the language, the language becomes increasingly more musical. And I think we might give some examples to the audience, or you might give some examples to the audience, of um, this idea of language shifting towards music, where a lot of Ulysses, when it's spoken aloud, you can hear the music of it and it carries you along with it. Whereas if you're reading it on the page, you can get terribly stuck. Uh, you often hear me reciting it, singing it. Yeah. Well, I, it's interesting to note because um, I think that if we look at chamber music, the first um, publication, um, it's a collection of 36 poems and nearly every poem deals with music or has some reference to music. So that's very interesting. Um, 
And so music almost becomes like one of the uh, dramatic personality, uh, along with the lovers in, in this piece. Um, however, just to so that we understand uh, the, the way composers bounce off different different types of uh, choice in writing. Um, effectively, this this collection is very uh, nice collection of Edwardian poetry. Okay, and it's completely cohesive in itself, and that requires uh, responses by composers which are more or less uh, completely cohesive and beautiful, as was demonstrated by the wonderful three yes. songs that we we heard in performance and in composition. Thank you very much. That was really very beautiful. Um, so we can see that the responses by most composers who set chamber music set wonderfully cohesive music. As we proceed through the, um, uh, the literary experiment that Joyce embarks upon uh, from uh, Ulysses onwards, we see that Joyce is shifting from writing literature which is only concerned with uh, a narrative um, uh, function yeah, towards um, having language play with itself, deal with itself, deconstruct itself, well, it's not doing it itself, Joyce is doing it, reconstructing itself. So there's a shift yes. from um, language being a carrier only of the narrative to language, um, if you like, deconstructing and reconstructing itself in a way that has um, creates new meaning and new possibilities in language. And this is why Joyce is, is perhaps the most significant modernist of the 20th century. In Absolutely, history. and um, he uses, Joyce uses various, let's say, compositional techniques to, almost like compositional techniques to, to write this music in the form of words, and onomatopoeia is one of them. Well, yeah, there's lots of, but I think the main thing before we talk about, I'm going to talk about only four headings, and we'll go through them very quickly because um, we need to go and hear the, um, see the films and so forth. But um, one thing it's important to keep in mind is that for, for Joyce, English was a language that was forced upon him. So English, he said that he was uncomfortable expressing himself in English. He should have been, he should have been expressing himself in Gaelic, but of course our history didn't allow that. And so um, I'm pretty clear that what he was doing, because he said that English as he received it came already with a tradition that wasn't his. I, I you know, from the Shakespearean bardic tradition, but that was not our tradition. We already had a very, very deep and rich Gaelic bardic tradition of our own until it was erased. Now, so we end up with Joyce, who is dealing with his musical, his musical literary genius through a language that he feels is not his. So he embarks on this uh, project of deconstructing and reconstructing. And he does this, he uses English, he uses English in, in so many different ways to reconstruct it in his own, in his own fashion, uh, including techniques like onomatopoeia. This is, you probably know what this is, a very simple example is sizzling sausages. Yeah, an example, I just picked some out of the, um, out of the book today. Um, for his, um, a, a quote from Ulysses, she smiles smirked, supercilious. Now there's, there's also um, a neologism in that, because the second category is neologism, where we're putting two or three words together to make one word. And the other great modernist to do that was Martin Heidegger, who was dealing with huge philosophical ideas and needed also to change language in order to try and um, articulate himself. So that wonderful line, she smiles smirked, one word, smile and smirked, supercilious. Now, just from the, the, the S sound, smile smirked, supercilious, we don't even need to know what it, sound, what it means. We already are getting a pleasure from the, the sheer sound of it. So there's this, um, so we have this um, onomatopoeic idea, the, the, the idea of uh, neologism, the, the creating new words. I'll just give you some examples. These fantastic examples are from, also from, um, from uh, Ulysses. John Wise Nolan, handsome married woman rubbed against wide behind in Klonsky tram, all one word. 
and the bookseller of sweets of sin, Miss do be that and she be did be that. <laughs> now that many uh, of you Hungarians won't quite get the, the, the deeper structure, which is a play on Dublin accents, but it's so, so clever. Yeah. And uh, we, we gain a new meaning there. Um, the stream of consciousness. Well, there was, it was, well I already spoke about uh, Joyce shifting the emphasis from narrative to uh, language's own internal um, you know, playing, if you like. Something yeah. that I think Sandra Vornish has done as well with um, Hungarian language. Um, what Boulez uh, calls uh, Joyce's growing anonymity in, in language. And of course, the very famous um, technique of stream of consciousness, yeah. which was not invented by Joyce, but certainly perfected, uh, by, perfected by Joyce. And the important thing to remember here is that by, in, by employing the stream of consciousness uh, technique, Joyce was bypassing the rules and regulations of the Queen's English and, you know, making a direct connection to the subconscious. This is not surprising. We're in the, we're in the period of the early 20th century. Freudian analysis is, is, is yeah. starting to um, take hold on, on collective consciousness of intellectuals in Europe. And so, um, by having Molly or Stephen Dedalus going across the beach early on, just talking to himself, and the language becomes less didactic and more completely connected to the uh, psych psychosis of the, of the subject. Um, and in the private world of um, Molly, for example, that famous eight chapter has no punctuation whatsoever, and we are almost voyeuristically invited into her inner and um, dangerously sexy world. And I thought maybe this is a good opportunity for Nicole Rourke to give us a rendition of this. <coughs> I love flowers. I'd love to have the whole place, women in rows. God, I have them. There's nothing like nature. The wild mountains, then the sea and the waves rushing, then the beautiful country with fields of oats and wheat and all kinds of things, and all the fine cattle going about. That would do your heart good to see. Rivers and lakes and flowers, all sorts of shapes and smell and colours springing up, even out of the ditches. Primroses and violets. Nature it is. As for them that says there's no God, I wouldn't give a snap of my two fingers for all their learning. Why don't they go and create something, I often asked them. Atheists, or whatever they call themselves, go and wash the cobbles off themselves first, and they go howling for the priest, and they die and unwind. Because they're afraid of hell on account of their bad conscience. Ah, oh, yeah. I know them well. Who was the first person in the universe before there was anyone that made it all? Who? Ah, uh, that they don't know. Neither do I, so there you are. You might as well try to stop the sun from rising tomorrow. The sun shines for you, he said. The day we were lying among the road of dandrums on Hove Head. In the grey tweed suit and a straw hat, the day I got him to propose to me, yes. First, I gave him a bit of seed cake out of my mouth, and it was leap year like now. Sixteen years ago, my God. After that long kiss, I nearly lost my breath, yes. And he said I was a flower of the mountain, yes, and we all are, are flowers. All of us. That was one true thing he said in his life, and the sun shines for you today, yes. That was why I liked him. Because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is. And I knew I could always get around him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could, leading him on till he asked me to say yes. And I wouldn't answer first. <laughs> when he looked out over the sea and the sky, I was thinking of so many things. 
of Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father and old Captain Groves and the sailors playing all birds fly and I say stoop and washing up the dishes they called it on the pier and the sentry in front of the governor's house and the thing around his white helmet poor devil half rose and the Spanish girls laughing in their shows and their tall cones and the auctions in the morning, the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who from where, all ends of Europe and Duke Street and the fowl market all looking outside larvae sharings, the poor donkeys sleeping half asleep and the vague fellas in the cloaks asleep in the shade on the steps and the big wheels of the carts and the bulls of the old castle, thousands of years old, yes! And those handsome moors, all in white and turbans like kings, asking you to sit down in their little bit of a shop. And Rhonda with the old windows of the Posadas, glancing eyes of the teat, hid for her lover to kiss the iron. And the wine shops half open at night, and the castanets, and the night we missed the boat at Algeziras. The watchman going about serene with his lamp, and oh, that awful deep town tower. And the sea, the sea, crimson sometimes like fire, and the glorious sunsets and the fig trees and the Alameda gardens, yes. And all the queer little streets and pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and geraniums and cactuses and Gibraltar as a girl where I was flower of the mountain, yes. When I put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used and how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I, yes, to say yes. My mountain flower, and first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts, oh, perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Obviously, Chamber Music is the most set uh, publication by Joyce, yeah. right up to you know the nineties and so forth. But I would say up to 10, 15 Irish composers have set new uh, music yeah. by. Um, what's interesting no. about Geoffrey Molyneux Parker is that he was actually born the same year as Joyce, and Joyce was very young when he was writing. You know, he, he wrote young and a lot. So. For a composer to be taking him on before he was really a known quantity was very interesting. And he set many of the poems uh, that, that were, were performed here. The other thing, just in final, that CMC, uh, there was a huge festival in Dublin called Rejoice Dublin 2004. Because that, 16th of June 2004, was the actual 100th anniversary of Bloomsday in the book. Uh, and it was published subsequently because it had been published in chapters. And then you wrote a work after Joyce won for that. I did. How did that go? Well, I mean, it went okay, but it was only three minutes long. Right. Um, the, the main difficulty back in those days, what was the date again? Uh, that? 2004. 2004. It was oh. copyright was the problem. Oh God, we're that old. Um, the, the real problem at the time was 
you could the, the copyright on James Joyce was, yeah. was um, very jealously guarded. Yeah. Uh, Joyce's grandson Stephen was um, R.I.P. was at that stage very very strict about releasing. Nobody could effectively set Joyce. Yeah. So um, I really did want to set voice. As it happened, I set voice through the flute. My flauta spoke and uh, played at the same time because I was very interested in this morphing between language and music, which is really the central um, occupation of Joyce. So I was wondering how would I get my text? How would I get a text without being arrested and sent to jail and fined? I need a lawyer. Yeah. So. And what I did was, having, you know, you know, obviously reading through Ulysses, I realised that actually Joyce is the greatest magpie of them all, because I, in the end, made um, a, a libretto text out of all the snippets of text that Joyce himself stole from everybody else, from the Latin Mass, from um, Irish sayings, uh, well-known French and Germans and so forth. So I put a, together kind of a stream of consciousness text based on everything that Joyce himself stole yeah. so I couldn't actually be uh, fined and charged. It's so. a perfect solution. Perfect. So uh, we won't delay you anymore. Then I was in Paris recently and they were launching the Paris Bookseller and I got a copy for you. Oh, that's very so nice. Touch. Thank you all Thank very you. much, folks. We have some gifts for Fuga and for the embassy with whom we dealt with direct. So Ambassador and Kevin and Mariana, if you can come up. And then, I don't know, the Fuga people are still here. I will inevitably give you the wrong bags. They are all different, so please forgive me. Mariana, I'm very happy to say we brought you some Irish silver for your colossal contribution to all Irish art forms for many, many decades, because I know I've been dealing with you many years ago as well. I was delighted to see you were wearing silver yesterday because I'd already yeah. bought it in Dublin. Yeah. And here's one of our bags. Um, Thanks again for coming and thanks again to Linda and Ben for a fascinating conversation.